Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to this Ask Us Anything on Spring Cloud Data Flow. I am Ilaya Perumal Gopinathan, and I am your MC for this session. With me joining the entire Spring Cloud Data Flow team. We have the subject matter experts on all the individual components that, ma that make up the Spring Cloud Data Flow. Right from Spring Integration, Spring Batch, Spring Cloud Stream, Spring Cloud Task, Spring Cloud Deployers, Spring Cloud Skippers, Spring Cloud Data Flow, what you have. Um, in a way, Spring Cloud Data Flow, <laughs> Spring Cloud Function. In a way, Spring Cloud Data Flow is one of those projects where it uses almost most of the Spring portfolio of products. It demonstrates the powerful nature of Spring ecosystem itself. And now let's go, let's get started with the you know, Ask Us Anything session. And just to uh, just a note to the audience, please log into Spring One Slack or Space and ask your questions there by logging into the channel one dash Spring One dash AMA. Okay, so we have a first question. This is, do you support authentication and authorization? If yes, what types of things that do you support? And uh, I think our friend uh, Yana could answer that question. Yes, we, uh, we do. We currently support authentication uh, flows via OAuth. And that's what is basically coming as is from uh, Spring Security. And the authorization happens by mapping into a Spring Security roles from a given OAuth scope, what you are going to get back from your identity provider. And um, that's quite simple way to do this kind of uh, role mapping is that slightly limited on some identity, identity providers and this reason why we are uh, currently kind of rewriting this part so that we are able to get uh, better support for uh, different providers like uh, key cloak uh, active directory etc et especially getting better support for uh, proper uh, group mapping out from the box from those uh, providers. That's it. Thank you, Yana. Um, so let's start with some of the commonly asked questions while we're waiting on the questions to be posted. Um, can we upgrade from Spring XD to Spring Cloud Dataflow? We know that Spring XD was the, the previous projects and we moved from Spring XD to Spring Cloud Dataflow for uh, various reasons. And, uh, the question here is, uh, can we upgrade from Spring XD to Spring Cloud Dataflow? David, could you answer that question for us? Um, should have been ready for that one. Um, yes, uh, you can't really um, directly upgrade from Spring XD to Dataflow. But um, there are a lot of things that do carry over. Typically, uh, the DSL is pretty much the same idea. We might have had some more enhancements and some different uh, properties that are supported with Dataflow. But the idea of having the simple pipes and filters type of syntax um, did survive Spring XD. The problem is, is that Spring XD was uh, its own runtime container uh, that that ran on bare metal and it's um, provided cluster support and, uh, and resilience and all of that um, with its own servers and the applications, uh, stream applications were modules that ran in that, that runtime environment. Today, uh, Dataflow deploys Spring Boot applications or standalone um, applications using or delegating to whatever uh, cloud platform you want to use, whether it's local Kubernetes or, or uh, Cloud Foundry. Um, and so the architecture is fundamentally different. So you would have to, if you have written modules, uh, you would have to pretty much um, port them over to be Spring Boot applications. Uh, 
and and use the bind you know use the binder in the new Spring Cloud stream type of architecture. Um, in terms of if you were using out of the box modules, those things would translate uh, pretty directly with the out of the box stream applications that we have. Thank you, David. The next question is on uh, the Spring Cloud Stream binder. Uh, the question is, what is a binder and how that is related to the application and messaging system? Uh, our expert, uh, Sobi, could you answer this question? I see Oleg raising his hand. Sure, Oleg, yeah, I can do it. Um, binder is the mechanism to translate specifics of uh, target or source system to an invocation model for your message handler. So in the case of Kafka Rabbit, as a good example, Binder translates the, for example, on the consuming side, it translates the message arrival to a call to a message handler, which could be a function, hopefully, or if you're using the old programming model, it could be a stream listener or service activator. And on the flip side, on the producing side, it, it translates the result of function invocation or message handler invocation to what has to be done with that result, which is sending it to a destination. So that's what the binder is. Binder effectively binds the target and source destination to message handler inputs and outputs. Uh, so, if I, may, if I may add, I mean, it's basically a, uh, a contract. So, you know, uh, using a binder, you can actually, you know, uh, as as all I've mentioned, you can actually connect to many different middleware implementations. Uh, at the moment, you know, we provide like out of the box Kafka and Rabbit binders. But there are many other, you know, uh, other binders uh, are existing today. So the idea is that you can actually uh, um, treat your application in a middleware neutral manner. Uh, if you went to Mark Heckler's talk today, he, he live demoed that the same application that he's, that he's using to talk to Kafka, um, in the next iteration, you can actually talk to Rabbit. So the binder is basically a concept that allows you to uh, do that. Okay. Thank you, Sobi and Oleg. The next question is, um, is there a way to map a file from file system in Kubernetes and process as a batch job in there. How does Spring Cloud Data Flow handle this? Would like to take this question. So Spring Cloud Data Flow, you can use deployment properties to map volume mounts um, and go at it that route. Um, and that will provide you with the persistent storage for the file system and then you can mount that to any Docker image you want. I actually demoed that um, on my Spring One Tour uh, talk a couple of weeks ago. That should be available on YouTube, where I mounted um, uh, that. It was a, it was via Kind, so it's not in the exact one-to-one -one mapping, but uh, the general prop the properties you have to map are in that example. So, yeah. Thank you, Martin. Um, the next question is. Uh... What, plat what platforms does Spring Cloud Dataflow support? And uh, this question is also one of the commonly asked questions. Do we support local deployment in production? And is that okay? I could take that one. Um, no, it's not okay. Um, we, we support um, local for mostly for development. Um, and we support Kubernetes and we support Cloud Foundry today. Um, the, the Spring Cloud Deployer is again, a service provider interface. So it's possible to have other implementations, but the three I mentioned are the ones that, that uh, we provide. Um, local is not recommended for production because you lose any kind of resilience. In other words, it will launch a, a Java process, but if that process goes down, there's nothing watching it. It just dies near stream breaks. So, so you know, unlike the cloud platforms where they, you know, are, are going to guarantee that you always have the state that you've asked for. And, uh, you know, that. so that's the main difference. Um, now, I guess Michael said the other day when we were talking about this, that 
it's valid if you have batch jobs, run spring batch jobs running on bare metal, um, and you want to use data flow to to manage those jobs, to launch them and um, and and monitor them and uh, and look at the results. That's that's uh, that's acceptable, um, but uh, for for stream applications, uh, we wouldn't advise it it's only for development. Yeah, just really quick to add onto that. Um, the reason we support local for the batch use case is to replace Spring Batch Admin. So Spring Batch Admin, you used to package your batch applications up with a web application that provided a UI uh, that provided some of the same similarities that, Spring, that Dataflow does. You would throw that all together in a WAR file and deploy it on uh, an application server. Um, we no longer support that. Dataflow, when you're running uh, these external uh, batch jobs, it provides basically the same guarantees as Spring Batch Admin did. Um, the only caveat is that we don't provide any uh, monitoring on the JVM's data flow spawns. So if you have a JVM that runs wild and, and uh, like, for example, never shuts down, we don't do anything about that. Not, now, Spring Batch Admin, if you had a batch job that went wild, it would same thing. You had the same problem. So it provides basically the same guarantees. So that's why we consider that a supported pro uh, uh, platform for that specific use case. Thank you, Michael and uh, David. And uh, on the question on the platforms that Spring Cloud Dataflow support for streams and batch in production, it's Kubernetes and Cloud Foundry, Tansu application service. Um, so our next question is, what's the difference between running a standalone Spring Cloud stream and task application versus running those applications using Spring Cloud Dataflow? Um, I'll take a shot at that one. Um, the truth is, is that a Spring Cloud Stream app and a Spring Cloud Task app are exactly that, they're applications. Um, whether I launch them by hand or use Spring Cloud Dataflow to launch them, it's going to be an application running out there. It's not run within a virtualized VM of Dataflow. Dataflow is an orchestration engine. Its job is to connect to a platform and be able to execute or deploy the container if you will, or if it's just an application on your local to be able to launch those out there. Once those applications are out there, Dataflow is pretty much done at that point. You can use Dataflow to do the following. I can monitor, um, like for tasks, um, I can go into one location and check to the task finish. What was the status of the task when it finished? If it's a batch job, did the job complete? Did it, you know, can and also through Dataflow, I can go in and restart that job. So the difference between is is that we're launching the apps, they all go out to the same place, but Dataflow gives me some certain strengths. One, again, it's that orchestration. I can go in and monitor my apps. What is their condition? The other thing that I can do, like in the stream scenario, I can upgrade my stream, I can roll it back. Uh, so I can do uh, CI CD on the streams that I deploy out there. Uh, conversely, I can also hook into uh, something like Wavefront. And then from Dataflow, I can go to that specific stream and say, I want to view in Wavefront or in some kind of time series database. What's the status of the, my stream or that app in my stream? How is it behaving? I can also do the same thing for the tasks that I have out and available. Uh, that are, have been launched in the batch job that's running, I can go out and see what the status is to be in the metrics there. So again, in closing, an app is an app that's launched on the platform. Dataflow is that orchestration tool for you. Thank you, Glenn. And the next question for us is, uh, what, what is Skipper Server in Spring Cloud Dataflow ecosystem? And do I need this if I want to run a batch job? Um, Mark's raising yeah, his ahead. hand. Okay, Mark, Mark go. Yeah, so Skipper is only used uh, when you're deploying apps or long lived apps and streams, generally speaking. And so if you're just doing batch, you, you don't need it. In fact, you can turn it off with a feature flag in the configuration so that you're only presented with stream features and long lived application features. Uh, its role is to um, act as a mechanism to roll a new version out 
uh, and see if it's healthy and then kill the old version or to roll backwards, for example, if you wanted to even from an upgraded version that was working. So it provides that roll forward, roll backward type functionality. And it allows you, allows you, uh, or change properties, you know, the version of the app is just one property, but you could change different properties of the app uh, as well. Uh, and then redeploy it. That's what Skipper is responsible for orchestrating. In like a, a primitive blue-green deployment strategy um, algorithm. Thank you, Mark. And uh, do we need Skipper for orchestrating batch jobs? No, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, sorry if it wasn't clear. No, you, you don't need it for batch jobs and you can uh, turn off any stream or long lived app functionality by configuring data flow uh, with a feature flag, as we call it. Thank you, Mark. It might be worth to mention that while you don't need Skipper, for a task, but uh, you can you can launch tasks from streams using the uh, task launchers. So that's kind of gives one way to. Well, you don't need it, but uh, you can do it. Might be a good, uh, Yeah, it might be for your use case. Triggering a batch job off an event might be important, right? In which case, you would use the long lived features just as a way to perform that initial trigger. Thank you, Yana and Mark. The next question is, I think it's somewhere in the lines of stream DSL and drag and drop feature we have. Should Spring Cloud Dataflow DSL be preferred versus the UI pipeline creation? I think the, to answer this question, the, when you drag and drop your application and create your pipeline, that generates the DSL itself. So the DSL is core part of your stream creation. Um, so that's uh, the answer to this question. Uh, let's get to the next question we have. Hey, Eli, I just, yeah. Just to not to diminish it, isn't it because of what you just said, isn't it become more of a user option because you, you've essentially accomplished the parity would be between the DSL versus the UI. Yeah. The, the, the drag and drop to... is the drag and drop is really just it, like an ID yeah. for for the DSL. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You can do them interchangeably. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. The third option, right, is not the DSL or the UI, but it's using the, the Java language DSL, which is creating an app, which in the long run, it potentially gives you the most flexibility and reuse of components. Or using the API directly, I would say. For my opinion, the, the, the reason why, why you're going to use one or the other is the level of automation you would like to achieve. I mean, the less point, possible yeah. uh, option for automation is using the drag and drop stuff. You can use the DSL to start driving, uh, writing some sort of script and provide some automation. The next level is to use the API that the data flow, the standardized API, or the DSL, Java DSL that is provided in order to, to build the more robust automation around your deployment uh, process. So that, that's the different level and the reasons why you might decide to use one and the other, in my opinion. Still, drag, drag and drop is the best way to, to try some, something new. While if you want to productionize it and make it more automated, I think the APIs and DSL might be the option. Well, it's it's also as you're as you, if you're doing a drag and drop in the UI, and this is a, a, a certainly kudos to the UI, is as I'm dragging and dropping, you'll see the DSL be rendered at the top. Conversely, as I'm typing the DSL at the top, you'll see it be automatically rendered at the bottom. So, like what Christian said, as I'm typing the DSL, if I make a mistake, the first thing you're going to see in the in the screen or the diagram or the graph below is you'll see it marked red. And it's like uh, there's a mistake here that you're as you're typing along. So you kind of get that validation even if you're using the DSL. So it's pretty or it's pretty cool. Yep. Thank you, everyone. The next question is: What is a data pipeline? This sounds very generic as well. Who wants to take this? I 
I think, it, it, like I said, this could be very generic and in the context of Spring Cloud data flow, it, this could be either a streaming data pipeline or you're composing multiple batch jobs and you create a, a workflow on the task applications. Uh, so, like I said, this is more of a generic question, but uh, yeah. Spring Cloud data flow. Maybe it's good to, to use the terminology of like source processor and sync, right? Uh, the pipeline is basically how data flows from a source, which in the data flow model is an application, then goes to a middleware product, you know, Kafka or Rabbit. Then something consumes that. Uh, maybe it consumes it and, and doesn't further do any uh, forwarding, right? In which case it's a sync, that's the end of it. Or it might do some transformation and forward it on to yet another destination in the middleware. And so it's the combination of connecting all of these messaging destinations that makes the end-to-end -end flow look like a pipeline connecting messages through different applications. And so that's what you're able to compose. I view that uh, you know, data pipeline is the aggregation of microservices to solve a business problem. Most of these microservices by themselves don't solve a business problem, right? Like it, it's a, a JDBC source or a, a, a Rabbit Sync or any of those kinds of things. Like those by itself don't solve the business problem. It's the aggregation of those microservices into that flow that fundamentally implement business value. I would just add to this that usually those those type of business problems and solutions is data intensive where actually important that that's what like the pipeline is why actually you the main source and the product and the, the subject of what you're doing is primarily data. And also if you think about it as well as if you're looking on the, the task side or the batch side, it's also a pipeline is almost a workflow where I can go in and have conditional launches. Um, I go in and I can split uh, my uh, at the uh, microservices or the uh, ephemeral microservices um, uh, and run them in parallel. Um, so you're given, you know, a pipeline that, if will, is an overloaded term, and it, it really does matter whether you're using a batch or you're using a stream. So this is a good question. Thank you, everyone. Our next question is: If we create Spring Cloud Dataflow applications locally, and how do we deploy them into Pivotal or PCF environment? Do we need to use the DSL for auto deployment or the dashboard? I think it's about how you develop your self contained application. And the Spring Cloud Airflow provides a way to register your application into application registry. So we, we, uh, once we let Spring Cloud Airflow know that your applications are registered, then from there onwards, you would either create your streaming pipelines, if you are working on streaming applications, or you will compose your batch applications or task applications. So once all you need to do is to register your applications into Spring Cloud Airflow, and from there, you would deploy your applications into the target environment, which could be PCF or Kubernetes. Yeah, so worth to mention to the, oh, yeah, the, the registration process of your app, if it's local, you know, if the server is running on Cloud Foundry itself, for example, then it needs to be accessible to the you know, server running there. So a common mechanism is to have your Uber jar file as a Maven artifact and register your application using a URL like Maven colon your registry. IP address or registry name and you know the path to the artifact or some people use HTTP as an endpoint to register the app with just serving up the uberjar file but generally we'd recommend having them published uh, into you know a maven type repository so that they can be pulled down on cloud foundry and then pushed into the into uh, the organ space of your choosing Thank you, Mark. Sound good, Dave? Or you want to get the red pen out? Yeah, that's basically what I was going to say. I think, um, yeah, the, the happy path is that you have a a rep, uh, Maven repo that's uh, you know usually in enterprises where uh, developers use it. They can push push to it and and get to it from their cloud boundary um, environment. So that's not always the case, but that's 
you can do that, then you can push your, you develop your apps locally, test them locally, and then push them out. And then you can um, register those apps in, in the Cloud Foundry instance, uh, pointing to that same repository where they where they were published. Thank you, David. Our next question is, uh, can Spring Cloud Dataflow support real-time and historical data processing? by real-time streams and by historical batch? Yes, it does. Let's see, answer. Some, someone wants to elaborate more on that? I think this is really related to the data pipeline. Data pipeline has this kind of two nature. It can be long leading processes or short leading tasks. You can orchestrate them together. And what's more important, you can even interchange. You can have a streaming application, real-time processing that triggers job tasks, or the output of job tasks can be used as an input for, for another streaming application, so you can have this kind of interchanging between data to rest and data and options. And you can support and one of the design goals for data flow is to be able to orchestrate those two different workflows. Thank you, Christian. The next question is on uh, like how one can understand the detailed message flowing through the pipeline when their applications, whether it is stream or task, deployed in production. We wanted to see for debugging purposes and also auditing the events when they go through from source to sync, et cetera. Who would like to take this part? I think this is more- It'll be a team effort because uh, don't we have a concept of a wiretap? Because the message, in my opinion, obviously goes in some kind of a binary format. It's a byte array. So just tracking it, like, it would be, in a way, almost like a security risk, right? Just as a transit. So, so based on my understanding of the, uh, well, my involvement with the data flow is the wiretap would be the appropriate way to do that. But uh, what about tracing? Huh? What, what about something like Zipkin? We, we are. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you could use something like Zipkin to to monitor is, things going through. It would be that obviously that's that's a tracing, so there's a sampling aspect and that kind of thing. But that's probably where I would start for just general flow visibility and that kind of thing. I mean, we get quite a few questions about that on Stack Overflow with people using Spring Cloud Sleuth. And in the early days, mm -hmm. there was some I mean, these mismatches on uh, header types and things. So I think they're all behind that now. Yeah, but if you don't only so go ahead. Oh yeah, if you wanted to see every message flowing through the pipeline, the best way would be, you know, for example, to create another stream which is consuming directly from one of the messaging destinations, and then you could you could just look at everything that was flowing through it because normally those messages have been persisted and, and under that under that destination, or you know you could just do a good old fashioned logging in your. <laughs> In your own app, but that wouldn't necessarily work for apps that weren't written to explicitly have a, a trace level type uh, configuration to log the message. So it's, it's really relying on the infrastructure itself. And the use case, the zip kink and this type of solution, cycling solution, the trade off there is that indeed you don't have the entire data. You can have a very good understanding about the representation about what goes through your system, just to give you a good picture. But for auditing purposes, it might, for, for, for some cases, it might not be enough to record any message that goes through your system. In this case, what Mark suggested to you would have to fork or wiretap your pipelines in one or in multiple places in order, depends on your use cases, what you want to store and keep in stuff. But yeah, if you, 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 you just want to understand what's going on in your system, uh, sampling and zipping is, is the right way to go. So this would provide you much more efficient and performant way to, to understand how your systems work, what is the type of data that goes to yeah, or or open tracing, it doesn't matter, right? Both yeah, of them. Yeah, open. any of those indeed. Yeah. You mean open telemetry? Yeah, sorry, open telemetry. Thank you for the answers. Our next question is with Spring Cloud Data Flow. With Kubernetes, what's the plan to manage secrets? Our current version is display, dis displaying secrets in clear text in the pod and job arguments. I think this is something that we recently fixed. Uh, who would like to take this one? Maybe Chris? 
Yeah, I think, uh, Glenn, I think we worked on this in the solution was the fast for key ref. Yeah, and I'm trying to remember, there's a property that we established that won't uh, pass those in, and it'll take and it, it takes advantage of the secret key ref. Uh, I'm trying to remember the property name, and I was uh, busily looking for, and I can't remember. I'm sure this uh, is documented. It is documented. It's just I was trying to do it in the last minute, trying to find it. But there's a property there that now that you can set that says don't send it in clear text as a command line arg. Use the secret that's available. But yes, that's that was added in two six two six x I think. Thank you, Glenn. And could you could you explain a bit like why we designed in a way to pass the command line argument like that? Um, because through Kubernetes, you're given uh, three types of entry points. Um, let me go. And it was exec, shell, and boot. So the default value was exec. And basically what that meant was any properties you would set, it would pass those into the uh, container as a command line arc. And so those would be, that would, you know, that's what the initial issue was. Um, and then you could also go in through a shell where you could give, uh, again, I'm going to refer to the document and probably give this Chris a little bit more. He probably can explain it way better than I can. But we have three entry point styles that you could use. Ezek is the default, but you can also pass them as via shell or boot properties. Uh, do you want to add anything like. to that, Chris? Yeah, I mean, I think regardless of the entry point style there, whether you set it as an environment variable, you set it as a command line argument, those things, the problem is it's just visible on the container when you do like a describe. But if you pass like a secret key ref, you're actually passing a key to a reference that's stored inside of a secret, right? So it's just the name of that key to that secret. Um, and then when the pod um, is launched over, it's resolved at runtime, it's injected into the pod's environment itself therefore we don't see it described right. obviously you see it inside of the pods environment itself to log into or exec into it or not but um yeah the command line arguments and the environment variables that are set in the container itself are exposed through yeah you know, it's, 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 it's also worth saying that there are you know certain definitely certain organizations that do kubernetes secrets you know as jokingly referred to as encryption uh, meaning it's just base 64 encoded so they're not really secret in any way if you have access to the cluster you can decode that base64 string and get access to it. So there are several approaches out there through init containers or uh, sidecars that you can configure which will handle the magic of getting those secrets to the container securely. It's probably too much to go into details, but Dataflow lets you specify what those sidecars or init containers would be. So if you use a solution like that, then you'll be able to still have data flow orchestrate the deployment of those apps using that secret uh, technology stack. There, there's quite a few of them. Vault is maybe one that's somewhat popular, uh, but it requires additional infrastructure, the Vault server from HashiCorp. And there is a Spring Hub Vault project. So if you have Vault in your infrastructure, adding that library to your Spring app uh, might be a more secure way to go to manage secrets. Vault and or config server, yeah, either one. Or config server, yes. That's the other choice that's sort of a non-native Kubernetes uh, approach. I think it would be worth noting as long as that string is encrypted in non-base64, right, regardless of inner containers or whatnot, I mean, those things are still stuffed inside the environment variable. So if you have exact access to the pod, you can still see it. Thank you, everyone. Our next question is, can we deploy our streaming and task applications to more than one platform at a time? Oh, yeah. Yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, the answer is yes. You, you, you do have to uh, create the stream with a different name, which is a little bit cumbersome, <laughs> the same stream. But you can register as many uh, Cloud Foundry org spaces and as many Kubernetes cluster namespaces as you want. Obviously probably a practical limit to doing this, um, but it's, you know, it's there to shoot yourself in the foot if you so choose. Oh, can I go back to that original, que the other question talking about the properties? The property sure. you want to set is use Kubernetes secrets for DB credentials. And then it's going to use the Kubernetes secrets. I was looking for that sucker as I know it's there. We documented it, but I found it. Woohoo. 
Thank say you. so Thank for you. the DAX. <laughs> oh, okay. That's Maybe put a link to it. On the deployment question, uh, when you say one uh, deploying more than one platform at a time, it's not an atomic operation. We can oh, yeah, configure yeah, yeah. data flow to deploy to multiple platforms, but it's it's a different stream for each each platform at this the same data flow instance can do it. Thank you. And uh, the next question is, are there any known issues with using Spring Cloud Dataflow for Kubernetes on a managed or value added platform like OpenShift? Or Tanzu. Works great on Tanzu. <laughs> I mean, not that we're aware of. I mean, we really are making very minimal use of Kubernetes resources that exist with every distribution of uh, of Kubernetes. So there, there's nothing that we take advantage of, but that means it should just work. Okay. Deployments uh, and services and jobs. And cron and jobs. jobs and pods. Well, that's implied, right? Replica set and all that. <laughs> okay. And I, I see that the questions are being typed. And uh, while that's happening, let me find some time to ask any you of know, the commonly asked questions. There's one there. Can now. I build? There's one. Oh, there's one. Okay. Yes. So, can I build non JVM stream or task application with Spring Cloud Data Flow? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, you can so, do both. Yeah, there's a big caveat though, which is all of the application metadata that we expose is, you know, is done in a way that is very centric to Spring Boot. Spring Boot has a, a properties format for describing all of its app configuration properties. So you, you don't get any help in the IDE or in the shell with completion of setting properties related to the and application can, types and um, those, yeah. there is yeah. in in our uh, data flow that spring that io website there's an example of deploying a python uh, source sync and, and task as part of a, a stream and also a, a task which is also written in python but it's doable but you do lose uh, functionality related to the features of properties of that application that metadata there's no sort of standard metadata format to to use for all app types, right? Uh, so that might make it a little more clunky uh, than otherwise. Yeah, essentially the data flow has got a contract of deploying apps that look like boot apps. So uh, if you've got a task, it's gonna, you know, as long as it can take the configuration options in the same way as a boot application would, it'll work. On stream-based stream apps, configuration and also the contract of how to connect to the messaging middleware um, as long as it obeys those basic uh, concepts that should work. And also just to add uh, one more thing. Uh, so Spring Cloud Airflow provides named destination. So if you have your non-JVM applications producing or consuming messages from named destinations, you can start streaming. You can actually construct streaming pipelines based out of that name destination. That's, that's one, one other possibility. Uh, let's get to another question that we have. Uh, why does Spring Cloud Dataflow need a database? So it uses it for two reasons. Um, first, the Dataflow server itself needs it to store some simple metadata, the, the definitions, the, um, uh, the metadata on the applications and, and that kind of thing. Um, so some light stuff around there. Uh, the other reason is for uh, the task executions and the task and Spring Batch job repositories. Um, if you aren't using ta the task side of things, there's a feature flag, you can turn off that capability and you won't need those tables. Um, but on the stream side of things, it's, it's uh, the data flow server itself stores, like I said, that lightweight metadata. There is a little heavier, um, manifest that skipper uh stores um but yeah 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 so for streams uh it's also important to mention when you're doing an upgrade or downgrade process or changing versions changing properties that that's managed by 
Uh, Yana is a spring uh, state machine project. And so as it transitions from one state to the next and coordinates you know, the rollout or, or the rollback, where it's at doing that blue-green deployment is, is persistent. As, as it was mentioned earlier, data flow is orchestration again, so it actually manages the life cycle of all the stream applications, and, and we need a place to store this, this, the state of this life cycle by the state machine. And beyond streams and tasks, uh, we also keep uh, audit information in, in the database, so when you when something is uh, modified, yeah. modified, then those are stored there as well. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. But having said this, it's what mentioned in the data flow support a multitude of different databases. It can be configured again against the wide range of different databases to keep this well. Starting from DB2. Thank you for the answers. The next question What out of the box applications, out of the box streaming applications are provided? And how involving is to build my own stream or task applications and use it with Spring Cloud Dataflow? Those are two or three questions. <laughs> I can yeah. probably take a cut at that. Sure, yeah. Toby. Uh, so at the moment, um, the recently GA uh, ops are actually based on a different architecture than uh, some of the new efforts that we are trying to, trying to pursue. So it's called a Spring Cloud Stream App Starter. So the App Starters model we basically provide like a, you know, as the name indicates, it's an App Starter. So we basically provide in you know, a components for building, you know, various source and sync and processor type of applications. Uh, so I think we are um, we are publishing about uh, 65 or 66 out of the box uh, streaming uh, streaming apps across various sources and things and processors. So these are like popular um, you know use cases like you know file source, file sync, JDBC source, JDBC sync, you know those kind of stuff. Yeah, as Kristen <laughs> points out, um, these applications essentially you know implement a lot of enterprise integration patterns so, so using Spring integration under the hood. Um, so some of the new efforts that we are actually doing in this area is that we are converting all the app starters using functions as the core model. So if you have a source application, the core logic of that source applications are carved out into a Java Uto function supplier. So that's essentially becoming a supplier uh, function. If you have a sync application that is uh, becoming a consumer model, Java Uto function consumer, and then for processor type applications, we use regular functions. So we essentially put all the business logic in these uh, core functions and then add binders on top of that to build uh, out of the box applications. That's the gist of it. Uh, the new repository is there in which we, uh, we provide all these new, new, uh, new components, both functions and applications. Uh, I think that the popular comparison uh, for these applications are to, you know, if you look at Kafka Connect, you know, many of these applications are sort of getting the same type of use cases, but, but the benefit here is that you can actually take these applications uh, and, and in addition to using with Kafka, you can actually, you know, use them with any of your binder implementations. At the moment, we provide out of the box applications for both uh, Kafka and RabbitMQ binders, but there's nothing, you know, prevents one from um, adding new binders and create, um, you know, new type of out-of-the-box applications. Uh, Christian, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. I think that was a kind of elaborate. I mean, uh, by adding a, a support for different binders, different uh, messaging middlewares, usually you, you just need to add additional dependencies to your application. That's what it takes. And the second part of the question was that uh, what how involving it is. Uh, yeah, it really depends. Our goal is to try to make it as uh, transparent to bring your Spring Cloud stream or Spring Cloud task application and make it manageable by um, uh, by data flow. 
skill depends on the level of services you would expect to benefit from the data for like monitoring or security, you may need to add some additional configuration of dependencies to your application of the data partners and leverage. Basically, but the idea is to, to be able to use your existing streaming or task application as it is and uh, just make it possible to orchestrate these errors. I, I think one other thing I would like to add, I mean, on top of what Christian and, and Sobi said, is that the fact that those apps are now converted to, uh, or the implementation of those apps are not converted to functions, and when I say functions, I imply supplier, function, consumer, uh, that essentially also means that the functionality within those supplier, function, consumers could also be used elsewhere. So that is that so. So it's almost like, think of uh, where the roles have split between functionality developer and application assembler, because what Sobi and the team is doing, they're assembling applications from the existing functionality, which is the functionality that was converted to functions, by a function consumer, right? So, but the functionality itself could be, effectively become just functionality, so you can use it anywhere. Right, including stream and data flow. Uh, so actually at the moment we are doing a 15 part blog series on this entire new app. Awesome. And we wants to you know, learn more about you know, how these apps are made and how do you want to contribute new functions to this repository. Take a look at the blog series on spring.io slash blog. You know, I think we already published like seven blogs, um, Dave Taransky. So the call is also doing the blog. So, um, um, so more blogs are, are actually coming out in the next weeks and months. Yep, that, th those are pretty much uh, covered. Uh, of the latest, what we have is the latest in there. Good that you pointed out that Sobi. Thank you for the answers. And I think we, we are coming to the end. I mean, probably we only have time for one more question. The question is, is there a recommended way to clean up the execution logs automatically as they can grow really fast? Uh, so currently we have support for manual deletion, but the question is uh, more about automatic deletion. I think it, it's a new feature. Someone wants to add more, more on it? Feel free to reach out to us on GitHub. It, it sounds like a new feature to configure automatic deletion of task execution logs. Um, I think uh, we are almost coming to the end. And uh, one more minute, and we can go one more question, I think we can shoot for that. What happens if Spring Cloud Airflow goes down? Will my streams and tasks continue to run? Yes. Right. Yeah, it's one of the it's one of the important architectural yeah, right. pieces of of data flow is that data flow doesn't do the work. Data flow orchestrates. So yeah, on Cloud Foundry, it does the equivalent of the CF pushes to you. Data flow does the uh, on Kubernetes, it's the equivalent of the, the kubectl pod stuff. So um so yeah. That's the Thank you short for answer answering. I know. For, uh, there, 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 I have the one bad guy comment. If you're running composed tasks and data flow goes down and you're not doing some kind of um, uh, 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 where you have it uh, multiple instances up to do load balancing across, composed tasks will not work. For because data a call back to data flow. Launcher, true. Yeah. 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 So task, task launcher, launcher composed task will pause until data flows back up so that they can call it, uh, run their workflows. So that's the only. It will continue caveat. to run, right? So that's it'll, it'll yeah. run and it'll wait till they time out to get back a hold of data flow. But yes, that was the only caveat there. Okay, yeah, thank you for the answer. I think we have come to the end of the session. Thank you for the participation uh, to the data flow team as well as the audience. And uh, we're looking forward to answer uh, the, uh, any other questions that you may have. And feel free to reach out to us on GitHub, Gitter, and on Stack Overflow. And uh, yeah, we have a, a few other sessions on Spring Cloud Data Flow as well. The last question just sounds like the um, topic of uh, 
of Christian's uh, spring one talk last year. Yeah, that's so maybe you can answer about. it in the Slack channel. Yeah, we have a quite good demo about this. It's also documented in our, in our site, but we have also a recording from last, last year's spring one together with Sabi, yeah. which does exactly Could, could you story. reply to that thread, Christian, as we are getting to the close of the session? Of course. Thank you.